Good morning, afternoon, and evening, everyone. On behalf of the AgriLinks team, I'd like to welcome you to this special webinar to discuss how the Feed the Future gender-sensitive climate-smart agriculture for nutrition initiative, it's quite a mouthful, but it's also called GCAN, aims to support USAID on the new global food security strategy. Our exciting lineup of speakers is uh, looking forward to sharing a draft framework for integrating gender and nutrition into climate-smart agriculture decision-making and to asking for your feedback on the framework. Before we get started with the content, I'd like to provide a few reminders. AgriLink seminars are a product of the USAID Bureau for Food Security and are implemented by the Knowledge Driven Agricultural Development Project. My name is Julie McCarty and I'm a Knowledge Management Specialist with the USAID Bureau for Food Security and I'll be facilitating the webinar today so you'll see my name in the chat box and hear my voice during the Q&A session after the presentation. The chat box is your main way to communicate today and thank you to everyone who has already introduced yourself. It's always really fun to see that we've got a global audience for these webinars. Throughout the webinar, we encourage you to use the chat box to share links and resources and to ask questions and give comments throughout the presentation. We'll be collecting your questions for the presenters and asking them after the presentation. So please submit them at any time. Uh, next, today's presentation is actually available to download right now on the AgriLinks event page for this webinar. Uh, and also in the file downloads box you see on the left-hand side of your screen. So you can download that on AgriLinks or just right there in the uh, webinar uh, screen right now. Uh, there will be some detailed slides today, uh, some pretty detailed frameworks that you'll see. So if you want to see the uh, presentation uh, PowerPoint larger on your screen, you can kind of hover over that uh, main presentation box. You'll see four little arrows on the top right of that box uh, pointing outwards. You can go into full screen mode if you'd like to see everything larger or uh, get the chat box off your screen. Uh, I'll remind you of that in the chat box later as well. We are recording this webinar and we'll post the recording, transcript, and other resources to AgriLinks within two weeks. And if you're watching the webinar right now, that means you're already on the email list to receive a link to the recording. So you'll get that in your email inbox. All right, so let's go ahead and dive into our discussion of uh, gender, nutrition, and climate smart agriculture. To give us an introduction to the purpose of today's webinar, I would like to introduce Meredith Sewell. Meredith is the Technical Division Chief within the USAID Bureau for Food Security. There she is. Um, within the, the Bureau for Food Security's Country Strategy and Implementation Office. In this role, she provides strategic direction for BFS investments in nutrition, gender, climate smart ag, and agricultural innovation systems. So I'll go ahead and pass the mic over to Meredith. Thank you, Julie, and good morning, everyone, and welcome. We're so glad to have you joining us today. And I have to say it feels really good to be connecting with our global community of practitioners. So I want to start today by situating this presentation in the context of the global food security strategy that was called for in the Global Food Security Act that was passed in July 2016. This um, new strategy was built on the existing Feed the Future strategy and developed over 10 weeks from July till October 1st by 11 Feed the Future agencies and departments. So um, Feed the Future includes many departments and agencies beyond USAID, including USDA, State, Peace Corps, and many others. Um, we held external consultations with key non-governmental and private sector um, stakeholders, including many you, of you, and we wanted to reflect learning and analysis over the past year, and indeed what we've learned since Feed the Future began. The strategy covers um, 2017 to 21, and it's available on feedthefuture.gov if you haven't seen it yet. It includes implementation plans for all of the um, government agencies that join together in Feed the Future, and builds on Feed the Future's experience and reflects changes in the global context since 2009. The strategy is heavily built around an updated results framework. I hope many of you have already seen this, um, and if you haven't, it's, um, I think, really what's really important in Feed the Future. Um, the goal is to sustainably reduce global hunger, malnutrition, and poverty, and it's um, consistent with current Feed the Future goal plus the elevation of malnutrition into the goal statement. 
in alignment with SDG2 and the Global Food Security Act. There's also now three mutually reinforcing and interdependent objectives to achieve this goal, two which are similar and one new one. So we have the inclusive ag-led growth, a well-nourished population, and resilience, which has been elevated as a third objective and something that we've really worked a lot on um, and learned so much about. So I'm going to say a little bit about what you'll see in here that's new. Again, we've elevated malnutrition into the goal statement and resilience as a third objective. There's also a much greater focus on holistic, uh, a holistic nutrition approach, including WASH. Also emphasis on taking a systems approach that prioritizes facilitation and works throughout value chains and supporting systems. We're trying to break down silos across sectors and between development and humanitarian assistance and also recognize different pathways out of poverty and strengthening the rural urban linkages. Natural resource management and climate smart approaches are also included as a um, cross-cutting IR with more attention to fisheries. And there's now a dedicated intermediate result on youth, which is really a new addition and something we're, we're thinking a lot about now. Um, we're also want to ensure we're thinking more deeply on finance investment and financial inclusion. Even with all these new things, we also want to emphasize that we're not dropping many of the areas that were so important and that we're building on. So continuing areas of focus include focus on high impact interventions that are evidence-based and will deliver impact at scale. Gender equality and female empowerment um, has a dedicated intermediate res result which commits us to measuring progress against it using the WIA and other measures. A continuing emphasis on country-led and local ownership, and also policy and governance, um, including greater emphasis on land tenure, which was mentioned multiple times in the Global Food Security Act. We're also emphasizing capacity building of um, humans as well as organizations and systems, and our partnerships with governments, private sector, civil society research, and university community. And of course, ha harnessing the power of research, science, technology, and innovation. So now it's turning to GCAN, the Gender Responsive and Climate Resilient Agriculture for Nutrition Project, and how that fits in. We know that um, over the years, recent years, there have been a number of frameworks and models developed for thinking about gender and nutrition, or climate smart agriculture and gender, or nutrition and climate smart agriculture. but there's not been a lot of thinking yet on how do we integrate all three of these things at the same time. So that's really the goal of this project, to ensure as we're thinking more, um, more and more about the impacts of climate and how we do agriculture, that we're also closely integrating what we know about gender and nutrition at the same time. Because we know to reach our goals of reducing hunger, poverty, and nutrition, we have to integrate all of these and also within the context in which we work, which varies by country. So we developed this GCAN project to advance our thinking, and also because we recognize the need to support our field missions and our countries where most of our work goes on with the latest climate science and understanding of potential impacts on agriculture, while also ensuring our Climate Smart Ag program is integrating the latest evidence on gender and nutrition. So in this webinar, our colleagues at IFPRI will present the framework they've been thinking through, including at a one-day workshop in October, to further share their ideas and get broader input on this integration concept. So we're really looking forward to your comments and ideas on this. I'll say there's another slide here that I won't go into, which was on some illustrative activities and outcomes um, for the um, global food security strategy. You can look at that on your own. I'm going to be turning over now to Claudia Ringler, um, who's with IFPRI and the Chief of Party for this um, GCAM project. And she'll be introducing her team and beginning the presentation. Claudia is a Deputy Division Director of the Environment and Production Technology Division at IFPRI. And she also manages IFPRI's natural resource theme and co-leads the Institute's water research program. So I'm going to turn it over now to Claudia. Thanks so much. 
Yeah, thank you very much, Meredith, for this great introduction uh, to GCAN and what we are trying to achieve. Um, as Meredith has already said, I'm the coordinator of GCAN, and I'm mostly going to introduce the team and let the team, you know, uh, lead all of you through the various elements of this new framework that we hope will support this global food security strategy with evidence-based research and new data analysis and visualization across um, gender, nutrition, and, and climate change linkages. So the first person I'd like to introduce to all of you is Tim Thomas. He's going to describe the key climate change trends um, that have really informed this global food security strategy. But in addition to giving you some global uh, insights, he'll, of course, zoom in a little bit, at least into one, of, one or a few of the countries. At IFPRI, uh, Tim leads the impact modeling team, which is a global economic model that looks at food supply, water supply and demand, and, and specifically impacts um, of climate change in agriculture. And he's two of his one of our two uh, climate change visits on the visit or wizards um, on chicken. The next speaker is Jessica Fanzo. Uh, so she brings in the nutrition perspective into um, chicken. And as you can see from her short bio on the slide, her title is already taking up half of the entire bio. And she told me she has not been seeking this job because of the title. But she is the Bloomberg Distinguished Associate Professor of Global Food and Agriculture Policy and Ethics at the Berman Institute of Bioethics, the Bloomberg School of Public Health, and the Nietzsche School of Advanced International Studies at Johns Hopkins University. She has various nutrition advisory positions. And very importantly, she has for some time worked on and thought about climate change nutrition linkages, which is so important uh, for GCAN. Last but not least, um, Elizabeth Bryan is really the heart and soul of GCAN. Um, she's a senior research analyst with IFPRI, where she focuses on sustainable agricultural production system, natural systems, natural resource management including various technologies uh, such as small-scale irrigation systems. But she also, and very important for this project, brings a gender lens to all of this work. And now, with uh, no further ado, I'll give you a very uh, quick one-slide overview of what she can do, so that you get some idea as the various presenters will lead you through climate change, nutrition, and gender content that will feed into this framework that Meredith has mentioned. So she can basically does four things. The first one is to develop a process or template for Feed the Future focused countries to basically support this global food security strategy. As Meredith has said, the focus here is on bringing in climate science and implications for programming, uh, focusing obviously on climate smart approaches, but you know going beyond traditional climate smart approaches to integrate nutrition and gender, which are key um, objectives and, and results under this new strategy. The second um, strand of work is to develop an innovative framework that brings together gender nutrition into the programming on, on uh, increased resilience and climate smart agriculture approaches for enhanced decision making. The third one is, as Meredith again said, we need evidence-based, um, more evidence-based decision making. And Feed the Future countries and missions have specific needs on tailored analysis, on the analysis of existing data and new data, especially bringing in a climate change perspective into the programming to better program uh, value chains, technologies, gender and nutrition-based strategies, ideally in a much more integrated fashion than before. Finally, um, as you all know, uh, Feed the Future has, from the beginning, collected a lot of data. There are a lot of population-based um, data sets and sources, and there's obviously many other data sources out there, but they have not sufficiently been brought together. And also, they haven't been made available to others, to implementers, to mission staff, and, and obviously to other partners and, and collaborating countries. And we, our goal is to do 
to bring these uh, data more to the open, so to say, and to also help our understanding of the zones zones of influence, like what matters, what doesn't matter, what has the you know what have the past years of feed the future research done and shown for better future program planning. So now, after this very really uh, two minute overview of what she can does and, and can do, uh, I'll hand over to Tim Thomas, who will describe to you the climate change um, content uh, of GCAN. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction, Claudia, and, and hello to everybody, and thank you for attending this uh, seminar. Uh, I, I have a lot of slides to cover, so I'm going to just kind of cover them uh, briefly. But I wanted to begin with just talking about climate. And climate uh, is a medium to long-term pattern of weather, and it usually involves the temperature precipitation variable, and it, it can, include, can include averages, uh, variability, and timing. So in this map, uh, what we see is the uh, mean daily maximum monthly temperature for the warmest month. And the reason I wanted to show you this is because uh, this is generally a, a critical variable because this generally occurs in the growing season, and it often uh, forms a constraint on crop productivity. So for example, uh, in a study I did on maize yields, if this number goes above 28 degrees Celsius, then maize yields begin to decline. So you can see here in this picture, any of the yellows and reds are just at the 28 or past. And so with climate change, with some warming, you can tell uh, that there'll be significant drop off from, uh, as a result of uh, climate change and, and warming. And this, I just wanted to very briefly show, is the rainfall distribution uh, map. Now, the question often arises is, uh, have we experienced climate change yet? And the answer, uh, very basically, is uh, a lot of places have. And uh, what this uh, map shows is uh, it analyzed the period from 1980 to 2010. And it, it asked the question, has there been a temperature trend in the warmest month of the year? And so if you see an area that's white, it was, uh, there was no trend, at least not statistically significant trend. Whereas if you see another color, there was a, uh, a statistically significant trend. And the, the darker the orange or red, the hotter the trend. And if it went in the green range, it actually had a cooling trend. So uh, you can see that uh, much of Africa, Europe, Central Asia, and Brazil, uh, temperatures in the 1980 to 2010 period um, had a, a very significant uh, trend. And some of those places had, say, three degree temperature trend. And, and as a, to, in the study I was referring to earlier um, uh, regarding maize yields, um, a three degree Celsius increase means a 25% uh, yield reduction. And then I wanted to begin just introducing you to uh, the climate models. You know, every, year, every six years, the uh, Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change comes out with a brand new set of models. And, and the last uh, set came out in 2013. And there were 61 different models. And uh, in, in uh, most of the global work on agriculture and climate change, we have uh, four models or five models that we use. And you can see just simply in this picture um, the geographic and spatial differences on climate effects, on temperature effects. And you can see that there's um, uh, differences in models. But what you do at least see also is that all of the models are, are projecting uh, temperature increases. Then I want to show you the same slide except for precipitation. Now, precipitation is a little more complicated because uh, what you see in the precipitation uh, maps is that they, they don't even agree on direction of uh, change. Some, uh, the lower left, for example, the, the uh, IPSL model um, shows that, uh, that uh, rainfall will increase in the, uh, in the uh, eastern and northern uh, portion of Zambia, whereas uh, most of the other models say it will either stay roughly the same or decrease. And uh, you can see also there's a big drying trend in the bottom right 
uh, map. So, so we have these conflicting things. And, and what we try to do is we try to take those and we put them into crop models. And we try to see, well, despite all these differences, is there any agreement uh, on, on what the models are telling us? And so we ran the model uh, for the whole world. But here, I just show you the Zambia uh, outcome. And uh, the, the uh, gray bar shows you, um, shows you the median result, whereas uh, the dots actually show you the individual climate models. And uh, this, these uh, data points were not done by me, but they were done by the AgMIP uh, GGCMI project which drew together seven different crop modeling teams to uh, see, one, how similar the crop models performed, and then also to see how results differed across different climate models. GCM uh, is the same as a, a climate model when you see that in the slide there. Now, we did a study. Uh, a few years ago in Bangladesh. And uh, so in the previous slide, what I showed you was the aggregated results for Zambia. But, but actually, we run this analysis at a pixel level. In, in the Zambia case, the pixels were um, half degree, which is about 50 kilometer. Uh, whereas here in this, uh, in this Bangladesh study, they're uh, five minute, which is about you know, nine or 10 kilometers square. But what we see in this is, was a very um, intriguing finding. And it, it shows the advantage of uh, doing these crop models and, and the advantage of um, taking a careful look at uh, locations and then um, different types of adaptation countries might take. So the, the, uh, the map on the left shows what will happen between 2000 and 2050 if the farmers continue planting the same type of seeds and the, uh, the same planting month for their boro rice, which is their winter irrigated rice. And then the, uh, the map on the right shows what would happen if farmers shifted their planting dates around substantially. And so by moving forward two to three months in planting dates, you get this actual boost in yields from climate change. And, and so that seemed like a strange result. So um, we, we dug deeper. And what we found for Bangladesh was that um, what happens is that right now it's a little bit too cold for, for farmers in Bangladesh to plant for the rice to thrive. So what happened here is that with a little warming, it now becomes OK to plant earlier. And also by planting earlier, the uh, rice miss, misses the really hot months during the growing season, because it can be harvested before the really hot months uh, hit. And here's, here's a, a map now that I wanted to talk very briefly about for Kenya. And uh, this is for rain-fed maize, what we're seeing here. And the reds are areas where maize is currently grown, but under climate change by 2050, you will not be able to grow maize there unless something dramatically happens uh, to develop varieties that will handle the higher temperatures. And the blue areas in here are areas that you currently cannot grow maize, but with the warming and a little precipitation change, but it's mostly a warming effect, these are areas that will um, start being able to be planted in maize. So this just draws all sorts of questions that we, uh, we care about. Questions like, well, what will happen to the farmers in the red area? Um, what, what ought to be done? Can, can policies be established that will help these farmers? And then the blue areas, you know, these, these are areas that people will find out um, are OK for maize. And people will likely tend to move into these areas unless there are actions taken to limit their movement. And I'm not here to judge whether this is a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, but um, what I'm here to say is that this could cause environmental problems if it's not properly thought through. OK, so next slide. Um, I wanted to now talk a little bit about climate smart agriculture. Now, uh, for those of you who don't know, climate smart agriculture consists of three main pillars. Um, sustainability, while increasing agricultural productivity and incomes, and it includes adaptation and 
building resilience to climate change, and it includes uh, reducing uh, greenhouse gas emission intensity and the outputs. So the whole idea of climate smart agriculture continues to evolve. In the beginning, it was sort of a farm level approach where people would think uh, how to help farmers change things. But then it got a little bigger, and people started thinking outside the traditional box and started thinking about um, the landscape realm of things and start thinking about system realm of things. So this is, uh, this is uh, how things are evolving. And now you can even extend this even further to include things like risk management, um, institutions, uh, and governance. And then, then now what we're trying to do in, in this project here is to extend it, the ideas even out to gender and nutrition. And then finally, um, I wanted to talk about uh, the, the uh, uh, different efforts of different governments. And, and uh, several years ago, as a result of one of the COPs, the, uh, the uh, uh, governments of the world um, purposed to develop INDCs, or uh, Intended Nationally Determined Contributions, to greenhouse gas emissions reduction. And so, um, so uh, what we see here is uh, excerpts from uh, Zambia's draft INDC. And you can see that they, they bring up some very important topics uh, that include uh, agroforestry and, and water use efficiency and drought tolerant varieties and conservation agriculture. On the crop side and on the, on the livestock side, uh, improving livestock varieties and changes in feeding patterns. So anyway, I, I know that, that that was a very, very fast uh, presentation, but uh, I would like to now uh, turn this over to uh, Jessica. Great. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. I'm going to present a bit of the information that we're looking at in the context of linkaging or the linkages between climate change and nutrition. I first wanted to start off with a bit of criticism in that it's really rare for climate change modeling, scenario building, and a lot of the climate change research to integrate nutrition. And I'm going to talk about five key points. And, and then how do we then start addressing nutrition in the context of climate change? So the first, we rarely build in nutrition outcome indicators and dietary metrics into climate change modeling. And there's reasons for this. We're limited on indicators um, that are effectively providing those linkages. And I'll talk about that a bit. The second, we often, and you'll see a lot of papers where we are looking at the impacts of what we eat, the type of diet we eat, on greenhouse gases or water footprint or land use. We often don't aren't really looking the other way around. What are going to be the impacts of climates on us, on our diets, and accessing nutritious food? There's a little bit of work going on on that, but it's mainly the other way around, where we're looking at what are our diets doing to climate change. So we need to start thinking about the reverse. What's climate, how is it going to change our access to food, the availability of food, and that being more nutritious food? The third is we need to understand the near-term effects of seasonality, which will have significant influences on nutrition outcomes and access to healthy and diverse diets. We think of climate change as being these very macro changes, but we know that seasons really can impact nutrition outcomes. And those shifting seasons, less predictable seasons, more severe droughts, more severe monsoons, will have a big impact. And we need to understand that more and bring seasonality back into the conversation. Number four, we need to react to rapid changes in food prices and volatility that will sure to, to be an issue with climate change. And the impacts, the broader, longer-term impacts of those food prices and volatility on household coping strategies, nutrition, and social equity. And the fifth is to understand the vulnerability, the entire food system, with regard to ensuring healthy diets. So to point one, um, including nutrition and dietary outcomes, we have some core nutrition 
indicators, the obvious ones you can think about is stunting, wasting, overweight, and obesity. We have some good nutrition indicators. We could have more. Things like dietary diversity scores, um, et cetera. But we need to start thinking more about the entire food system that brings in waste and loss, food safety, resiliency, ecosystem health. And there's a lot of indicators that we can borrow from other sectors and start applying them to the nutrition and diet lens. And this figure I'm showing you is from a paper recently in the Sustainability Journal looking at the variety of metrics that we can borrow from across different disciplines to really get a full picture of a food system and what that would look like in the context of climate change. And a lot of these indicators are out there. There's data for them. We just start, need to start applying them and using those to better inform policymakers and programmers. The second is, again, we are often looking at the type of diet that we eat and its impact on climate change. So for example, we know that diets heavy in red meat have bigger impacts on water use, land use, and greenhouse gases, as opposed to a vegetarian diet. So we're often looking at the way we eat and its potential impacts. And that in itself is controversial, because changing the way people eat, changing their behavior, things like carbon taxes on high carbon foods are controversial right now. It, you get into ethical issues around self-liberties and autonomy and paternalism. But we often really are not looking the other way around of how climate is going to impact diet. And this is figure is showing you different uh, diets and, and their change in greenhouse gases. And you can see that uh, meat has a higher impact than, for example, a vegan diet. The third is the seasonality. We know that seasonality is really, really important for nutrition. Extreme events, including droughts and floods, have impacts on the variability of nutrition status. This is a figure coming out of the Global Nutrition Report in 2015, showing you that there is variability, particularly in issues such as wasting. And we need to start looking at these more carefully and doing real-time surveillance. Seasonality. Seasonality, which climate change will affect, is going to affect food prices and the volatility. And we know that low-income consumers spend a good portion of their income on their diet. And so if food prices are increasing, there's more volatility, less predictability, we then have to start thinking about coping strategies. So households often, one of the first things that happens is there's a decrease in dietary diversity. Then you see reductions in food consumption. And coping strategies, if social protection mechanisms aren't put into place, can become more severe, more difficult choices have to be made, which can result in, in poor nutrition. And I bring this up because there is a bit of a worry about food prices and where we're moving. This figure on the left shows you the food price index. And in blue, you'll see the two spikes in 2007, 2008, and again in 2010, 2011, that coincides with the Arab Spring. You saw these big food price increases. The green uh, bars show you the food-related protests and riots. So with these food prices and the volatility that they bring, we're seeing more social unrest. And this is incredibly worrisome. So in the context of climate change, are we going to see more of these protests and riots and social unrest as we don't have good control over food prices and, and, and what that brings? And this can, of course, lead to more serious long-term conflicts. And the figure on the right shows you um, countries of conflict in, in red, in the red line, um, who've been, so countries who've been affected by major civil wars or conflict, they see much less reduction in stunting over time, chronic undernutrition, whereas countries who've been quite unaffected by civil conflict, shown in green, have seen more rapid reductions in stunting. So conflict clearly has links to improvements in nutrition, but the underlying context of that could be complicated and multifaceted, but food prices 
it seems, does, does play into that. And the most important thing and where we can really act is the vulnerability of the food system. This is showing you a partial diagram of a food system framework that will be coming out in the UN High-Level Panel of Experts Food Systems and Nutrition Report next year. And we know that food moves through a system. It goes from production, storage, distribution, processing, and packaging, and then it hits a market. And consumers engage with the food system in what we call the food environment. This is where consumers make behavior choices and decisions about what kind of food they're going to purchase, what kind of food they're going to acquire. And this influences their diets, not only the type of diet, but the quality, the diversity, and the safety. And this ultimately leads to nutrition and health outcomes. Now, this whole food system is going to be impacted by climate change, the value chain of food moving through the system, the food environment, and consumer behaviors. We have the option and, and the ability to start looking and unpacking this food system and seeing where climate change effects will occur and how do we adapt and mitigate. And this is showing you um, this, this figure, although wordy, shows you the value chain in the middle from inputs to consumption. And we want to ensure that we maximize nutrition entering the value chain at all of these steps and minimize nutrition exiting the value chain. So, and when we layer climate on top of that, a lot of the work that we're doing in nutrition or that we could do in nutrition is climate smart. So Tim had indicated that climate change is happening. It's not something that will happen in the future. So we need to make short-term decisions about what we do across the food system. We know what to do to make value chains more nutrition sensitive. These inherently address some of the climate issues that we'll deal with as well. So if you look, I hope that people can look at this value chain framework in, in more carefully because there's a lot of different entry points. So while I presented the idea that we still have a lot to learn. We, we need more nutrition integration, new, more nutrition research into climate change research. We still have a lot of things that we can act on now that would be nutrition and climate smart. I'm just going to end with two slides. So one of the, the countries of focus for GCAN is Zambia. Zambia has a, a big burden of undernutrition. Stunting is 50, uh, 40%, very high. Anemia in women is very high, almost 30%. And there's lots of micronutrient deficiency issues, iodine deficiency in children, iron, vitamin A, and same with the women of reproductive age as well as pregnant women. There's an interesting project that IFPRI and CONCERN have, have been working on. It's called the RAIN project that some of you may know about realigning agriculture to improve nutrition. Um, this was looking to reduce the prevalence of stunting in children through an integrated agriculture health and nutrition approach. Most of it was focused on supporting effective agriculture interventions to increase year-round availability and access to nutritious foods. And there's been some great results coming out of this project showing positive associations of increasing production diversity with dietary diversity in, in young children as well as children 24 to 59 months and, in, and some reductions in stunting. And one easy entry point, if we start thinking about commodities across the value chain that potentially have a low environmental footprint is fish. Fish is a very, it's very nutritious. Um, it has a much lower environmental footprint than something like promotion of, of cows or pigs. And we're seeing that fish is commonly consumed uh, in Zambia. So this could be an entry point to try to push on a rich animal source food that can be found in a cost-effective way that has a low environmental footprint. So the question is, is, how do we expand that? How do we expand sustainable agriculture and improve the access to that? and promote the consumption of small fish for improving nutritional status. 
So something maybe for a discussion of talking about fish, really important, a woman's crop, um, giving the technology and the knowledge to women to be able to promote this not only for their income, but also for, for the nutrition and health of themselves and their families. I'll end there. And I'll turn it over to Elizabeth. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, Thanks for all the other presenters. I'm going to specifically talk a little bit about the linkages between gender and climate change. Um, so Tim sort of gave us a picture of you know, climate change and resilience and climate smart agriculture. And Jess talked about the important elements that we need to think about with respect to climate and nutrition. And I'm going to bring in the gender lens to all of this. And then at the end, I'm going to pull all these elements together to present the draft framework that we've developed as part of this project, because we really want to get all of your input into these elements and how we present them and to make sure that we're covering all of the linkages between these three topics. So why do we care about uh, gender and climate change? Well, there's a, a big body of evidence that shows that men and women have different uh, gender roles within the household and in the community. They have differential access to resources and assets. And they also face uh, different constraints in terms of adopting new technologies or practices or livelihood strategies. And we also know that they have different preferences for the kinds of strategies and responses that they take um, in response to climate change. And, and in general, how they spend income and things like that. So we need to better understand all of these factors in the context of climate change because they influence the kinds of decisions that men and women take in response to climate change and in response to specific shocks. And these decisions have implications for the kinds of development outcomes that we care about, like nutrition, food security, environmental security, education of children, things like that. These uh, different factors also can highlight entry points for um, increasing women's empowerment. So if we can understand their roles better and the constraints that they face, then we can find these entry points in order to support their empowerment. And we also need to consider all these factors because they help us understand how the costs and benefits of different agricultural interventions, including climate smart agricultural interventions, um, have different implications for men and women in the household and how the costs and benefits are distributed. Um, it's important that we think about these things so that interventions do no harm to women um, and potentially also lead to ways where women can actually benefit and we can have some gender transformative outcomes as well. And we also want to think about these factors because we want to increase women's involvement in climate smart agriculture approaches. So we need to be able to think about what their preferences are so we can have the kinds of technologies, approaches, and strategies that meet their specific needs and, and services that meet their needs. And, and we can find those entry points in order to be able to reach them with information so that they can actually adopt these practices. So just digging into what we know about gender and climate change specifically, there has been a growing body of evidence um, in this area in particular, but there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. We do have some evidence on the differential impact of climate shocks in particular on um, men's and women's um, asset dynamics. So whose assets get sold in response to a shock? And we know that you know this depends on the kind of shock and also the kinds of roles that men and women have in, in their livelihood strategies. So we do have some evidence uh, from limited context, but there are lots of other impacts that we might want to think about in terms of how climate change affects men and women differently and you know, moving beyond looking just at climate shocks, but looking at how longer term climate stressors affect men and women differently. And we do have growing evidence that um, the adaptive capacity of men and women is very different. Um, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit more in the next slide in the context of Zambia. And we also are beginning to look more at how 
different climate smart agriculture approaches or just um, agriculture interventions in general um, are just, you know the costs and benefits of these how they're distributed across men and women in the same household but there needs to be more evidence on that as well and we also need to think more about the linkages um, in terms of how climate smart agriculture leads to different well-being outcomes like nutrition, food security, and women's empowerment, and how bringing women into, um, you know, having them participate more in climate smart agricultural approaches can improve those well-being outcomes. So there is evidence that shows that women spend income differently and things like that, but we need to examine this even more in the context of climate change. And we also need to think about, OK, so we know what the constraints to women's participation might be, but what are the approaches that we can use to effectively reach women to bring them into climate smart agriculture programs and projects? So what we've identified in terms of looking at gender differences in adaptive capacity is that we find that men and women often have different user characteristics. And these are things like the ways in which they perceive climate change and their human capital um, that influence the kinds of choices and the ability to make choices um, in response to climate changes. Um, we don't have particular information from Zambia on differences in terms of how men and women perceive climate change, but we know from other contexts that there are these kinds of differences. What we do know from Zambia is that women are tend to be more illiterate than men. So you could see how that might limit the kinds of response options that they have available to them. And we also know that women, and particularly women from female-headed households, are more likely to be poor, which also limits the range of options that they have. Uh, we know from many, many contexts that women and men have differential access to information on climate change and information on what are the appropriate responses to take uh, to respond to climate change. And just one particular example from Zambia is that we know that women are less likely to receive training on conservation agriculture, which has been one of the approaches that's been encouraged um, as a climate resilient strategy. We also know that men and women face very different institutional environments. So this is things like their ability to join groups, to speak in public, the kinds of social norms that determine which strategies they're able to take. And so from Zambia, for instance, we can see that you know, the dual system of statutory and customary inheritance laws um, has, you know, may have some disadvantages for women in terms of their ability to be able to access land, especially married women. So the statutory laws uh, seem to be able to uh, get female-headed households to begin to own and control more land, but women from married households still have to rely on their husbands in order to access land. And we see that only uh, women control decision-making on about 10% of plots on average um, on the land of the household. So, and then we have to think about things like social norms and how those determine the range of responses that are available to men and women. So for instance, social norms might inhibit uh, mobility for women, which inhibits their ability to participate in the market and sell different crops and gain the income from that. Um, as Jess said in her presentation, fish might be a very important strategy in Zambia um, to improve nutritional outcomes but women's access to aquatic agricultural systems is more limited than men's. So we need to think about how we can get them more involved in the production and in benefiting from the practice itself, and not just in, on the consumption side. And I think it's important to remember that the constraints to uh, women's responses to climate change are not only external to the household, but they're also internal to the household. Um, so we know that men and women have to take a series of decisions um, and within the household in terms of how and when particular practices or technologies are used, who has access to those technologies, who can, has the right to sell or profit off of the technology as an asset, and who controls the outcomes from the use of that technology. So who controls the yields and whether they're consumed at home or sold in the market, and who controls the income from the sale of those goods. And so um, it's important to think about this inter-household bargaining space and 
whether or not women are able to participate fully into these decisions to ensure that their needs and preferences are being met in terms of the responses that are taken at the household level. And women's ability to influence these decisions, both within the household and within the larger community, depends on several factors. And these include their, the degree to which preferences and interests align or differ between men and women. And although we don't have much evidence from Zambia on what are the gendered preferences for responding to climate change and shocks, we find that from other contexts, uh, these factors are very important and that there are often very different, uh, that women often have very different preferences for how to respond to climate shocks. So things like their preferences for different crop varieties or types or different strategies like adopting improved cook stoves or investing in food storage facilities, um, they may have a greater need for those types of strategies. Um, we also know that access to resources is important in being able to influence decisions about responding to climate change. And we know that men tend to have more access to credit, land, labor, and productive assets, which enable them to um, have a, a greater range of adaptive responses. And we also know that um, bargaining power is very important. And women often have less bargaining power to influence decisions in the household. And one of the indicators that we often look at and use is the Women's Empowerment and Agriculture Index to see the degree to which women are empowered um, with respect to men. And what the uh, way our results show from Zambia is that gender inequality tends to be very pronounced um, in access to and decisions on credit, in uh, women's workload being greater than, than men's, and in women's ability to control assets. Um, in terms of women's ability to influence decisions that are taken at the community or policy level, we see that there's a skewed distribution uh, between women and men um, in leadership positions in the agricultural and natural resource sectors uh, within Zambia. And another critical thing, and this is also something that's being incorporated into new versions of the Women's Empowerment and Agriculture Index, is that domestic violence is important um, in the fact that it limits women's uh, bargaining power within the household. And we find that domestic violence in Zambia is high. And even women, and half of women, and one third of men believe that it's justified under certain conditions. So this is something that, um, that needs to, to change in order to really give women the power to influence decisions that are going to benefit them within the household. And so we do have information on what are the key factors and elements that are important when we think about climate change and gender. Um, and a lot of the evidence that we have is very local and context specific. And we need to build on that evidence base. Um, we also have certain areas where we could really um, build evidence in terms of the linkages. So we need more evidence on the gender differentiated impacts of shocks and longer term climate change impacts on men and women and how those are different. Um, we also need to look more at intersectionality, so different groups of women and how they are affected by climate change and how they are responding to climate change. So this could include like married women versus female-headed households, young versus old women, uh, women of different ethnic groups, etc. We also need to think more about what are the entry points for increasing women's participation in climate smart agriculture, both inside and outside the household and what sorts of, you know, inform how we can reach women uh, better with information so that they can participate in these strategies. And another thing we need to think about more about and, and to build evidence on is how do, does different climate smart agriculture approaches, how do these um, affect men and women and outcomes for men and women? How are the costs and benefits of different approaches um, distributed in terms of things like women's time use and men's time use? And we need to think about um, how bringing women into this process of climate smart agriculture can uh, improve food and nutrition security and other outcomes that we care about. And so, you know, we believe and what we're doing in this project is trying to develop a framework and some tools based on this framework and, and to do research around this framework to try and think about all of these things and identify these research gaps and also use this framework to guide interactions with the missions and with partners and others so that we can have a discussion around the intersection of all of these things 
and begin to think about entry points for addressing these challenges together. And so what we've done um, is put together this framework um, based on all of the sorts of different issues that you've heard in the presentations today um, in looking at several different frameworks, um, including frameworks on resilience, the Frankenberger framework on resilience, the spring framework on agriculture for nutrition, the IFRI gender and climate change framework, and the climate change nutrition framework that was developed for the Global Food Policy Report. So uh, we brought all of these frameworks together. We had a workshop on October 13th with our USAID uh, counterparts and many other implementing partners to talk about all of the elements from these frameworks and how they fit together and how we can bring them together in an integrated fashion. And then the IFPRI team has now gone back and put together this very rough draft of a framework that integrates what we think are some of the key elements with respect to um, resilience, climate smart agriculture, gender, and nutrition. And so I'm just going to walk through these elements briefly here, and then I you know, look forward to following up with those of you who have feedback and comments for us and are interested to help us develop this further. So if you look in the, the top left corner of this framework, we have the climate signal, uh, which is the exposure to climate change. And this includes things like short-term climate shocks, like droughts, floods. And it also includes um, long-term climate stressors, things like long-term changes in temperature and rainfall, changes in seasonality and the variability in seasonality, um, changes in rainfall variability, the incidence of droughts. Um, and we also wanted to think about, um, you know, what can be done to increase resilience during normal or good weather years. So we included just sort of normal weather years in this uh, climate signal uh, element. And then the degree to which climate change affects people and systems depends on the context in which it's occurring. And so that's this blue box that surrounds um, the other elements of this framework. Um, and we call this the enabling and disabling environment for resilience and vulnerability. And so what we start with are these set of initial conditions. So climate change responses are filtered through these initial conditions. And these um, include things like the ability of people and systems to absorb the shock or the stress and the ability to adapt to that shock or that stress. And it's important that absorptive and adaptive capacity are going to be different. As I had mentioned earlier, um, men's and women's, for instance, adaptive capacity depends on many factors. And we know that women's capacity is often constrained. So for example, women would have less access to information and technology or lower human capital or less access to natural resources. And that would then um, limit the range of options that they have and the decisions that they can take in response to climate change. And we know that, for instance, men and women are involved in different uh, livelihood uh, roles within the household. And so their ability to absorb shocks um, and absorb uh, climate stressors depends on those roles that they have. And so they may be more or less exposed to the kinds of climate changes that are happening in their context. And then we move into this, uh, what we're calling the decision space. And here is sort of an action arena where different actors, and this includes men and women within households, it includes household responses, community responses, and also all the way up to the sort of state and regional policy responses to um, climate changes and shocks. Um, and we right now have grouped these response choices in terms of the degree to which they're adaptive or transformative, um, whether or not they're just you know, sort of normal risk management practices or coping or survival strategies, which would indicate a more limited range of, of options for responding to shocks and climate change or sort of maladaptive responses. But there are many other ways that we can think about sort of categorizing the kinds of responses that men and women in groups and communities have to climate change. 
Um, and these responses happen over different time scales. So these could be short-term responses like changing a planting date or planting a new crop variety, or it could be a more medium-term response such as agroforestry or investing in infrastructure or food storage facilities, things like that that may have longer-term um, time horizons associated with them. And the ability of different actors and groups to make different responses as I mentioned previously, depends on the degree to which preferences and priorities align. Um, it depends on their access to resources. Uh, it depends on um, the different kinds of bargaining power that they have in order to affect these kinds of changes. And then drawing on the agriculture for nutrition framework, we've tried to identify some pathways through which these responses can lead to either greater resilience or greater vulnerability to climate change and these sort of intermediate outcomes that happen after uh, changes are made. And so these pathways are sort of the income and production pathway. So you can think about, um, you know, planting different, you know, more resilient or hardy crop variety might um, increase income for the household. Um, or you could think about other kinds of larger scale strategies like trade or food storage, which might improve income, or other market-based strategies that improve um, income at multiple levels. And you can think about the time use pathway. So, you know, how, you know, if, if a new strategy could free up time for women, for example, to invest more in caring practices for their children or or other kinds of um, behavioral changes, then that could have uh, positive effects on, on dietary quality or nutrition. Uh, we have to think about the food environment, how changes in the food environment can lead to improved outcomes or worse outcomes. And I'm sorry, but this looks like the, the covered up here a little bit in this picture. We have a little bit of <laughs> formatting to do, but there's also this sort of production pathway. As just mentioned, you know, in the case of Zambia, um, production diversity was shown to lead to um, improvements in dietary diversity as well. So there is the potential for uh, the production pathway to lead to improved outcomes. And then in terms of these intermediate outcomes, um, these are things like improved food security or greater food insecurity, depending on you know, the degree to which people are able to respond to the, the challenges that they're facing. Um, it could be either greater nutrition, adequate nutrition, or inadequate nutrition, and the unavailability of, of good quality foods. And these all, the other outcomes relate to environmental degradation or security. Um, importantly, we have a bar that links these outcomes back to the climate signal because as part of this environmental outcome we have to think about what is the mitigation potential or you know what are the degree to which emissions are increasing and we also want to think about women's empowerment as an outcome in itself because it's important um, to think about gender not just in the ways in which we can in improve other outcomes but in thinking about improving women's status as an outcome in itself. And then these sort of intermediate outcomes feed back into the initial conditions that households and communities face in the future to other climate shocks and stresses that are happening. And so I'm going to go ahead and stop here and I really look forward to getting your feedback on this framework and um, in thinking about other elements that we might be wanting to include here. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. And you know, we are coming to the end of the presentation. And as you have heard so much, um, so much content and details, and including some details on Zambia. And the reason for that actually is that we just went there and spend a few days with the mission uh, there. And so we did some reviews for them. But to summarize a few things that we want all of you to take away uh, from this morning's presentations are first, we do have this new global food security strategy. And it requires us to strengthen climate resilience in all Feed the Future activities. <clears throat> Next, uh, I hope that, I mean, you have seen, but you already knew before, that we need and we can act on climate change. Climate models do show very consistent warming trends, and they do allow us to assess the impact on productivity 
and there is reasonable agreement in results. Third, and also as some of the comments that we have seen in the chat box, is uh, the third comment is heterogeneity matters. You've seen it in some of the uh, climate impacts, um, but also I think some of the uh, messages from nutrition and, and gender were very clear. There's spatial heterogeneity. Um, there are differences in people living in highlands and lowlands. Um, and as a result, we will have winners and losers from climate change. Uh, so there are both opportunities, and then there's a lot of uh, threats and losses, and, and we have to act accordingly. Um, on climate smart approaches that are you know now really a lot of people are talking about them. Um, so I, the understanding overall is clear. I, I think we all believe we understand more or less what climate smart approaches are, but we don't at this point understand sufficiently how gender and nutrition are linked to that. Uh, what are the gender and nutritional outcomes? What we really need to do, as Jess has, has demonstrated, is to increase um, both climate smart nutrition and women's along the entire value chain. Maybe you've seen some uh, chat box mentionings where people say things went very well until the business became too profitable and men took over again. The, the fifth point is policy alignment. Gender nutrition sensitive climate smart approaches need to be not only cognizant of local indigenous knowledge, but they also need support at national and, and at the global level. So we need some kind of, we can have disjoint um, activities because otherwise the local ones will not be recognized at the larger level. The vulnerability context really matters. Um, the uh, you know, absorptive and adaptive capacity. And it's very important to, to include safety nets and specific support for the most vulnerable, those who are being left behind uh, from adverse impact of climate change. And finally, I saw there were several questions on metrics. Um, we still need to improve our metrics systems to better measure changes across the climate change, nutrition, and gender nexus. And with that, we um, conclude the presentation, and we're very happy to go into answering questions, uh, all of the questions that you have posed in the chat box. Um, not sure if the moderator would uh, first say a few words about that, or if we should jump right into that. Um, yeah, thank you so much to all of our presenters. Uh, this is Julie McCarty, and um, yeah, we're really excited to see the incredible comments and questions in the chat box. Uh, they will all be collected, uh, shared with the presenters and the GCAN team uh, for consideration as you know, this framework is being developed. and and uh, you know, brought into its final form. And so we probably won't be able to get to all of the questions today, just based on time. We have about uh, 20 minutes left. But we'll ask as many as we can. And as a reminder, this webinar is being recorded. And um, you will get an email uh, within a couple of weeks uh, that has the recording, the transcript, uh, any additional resources that the presenters would like to share with you. And we'll try and uh, address any further questions in that email as well. So be on the lookout for, for that. Um, so I'll just kind of run down. We've been collecting your questions uh, in, a, in a separate screen. And uh, we're going to run down as, as many of them as we can uh, before we wrap up today. So I think I'll start kind of at the top with a question for Claudia from Indra Klein, um, who asked that given the, the data that have been collected and analyzed, how is it being strategically shared with governments, other community partners, uh, ag producers, seed manufacturers, and anyone who you know has a stake in all of this data that's been collected, especially with regard to long-term thinking and action? Claudia, can you chime in on that? Yeah, just very quickly. Um, you know, we couldn't share today with you our microsite because it's currently under development. But at least under GCAN, we will have a, a data and analytics uh, subsite where all the um, research um, and data analysis that is being done under the project will be posted. Uh, we are preparing both shorter policy notes um, on countries and feed the future zones, um, and also specific uh, analytical pieces. And, and finally, also some review papers, for example, just on the state of knowledge um, and entry points for climate change nutrition linkages. So for some areas where we really have very large gaps. But in general, US government and, and most governments have signed up um, you know, to, to open data policies and standards. So actually, 
you can find a lot of data nowadays. The, the key really is to, to understand how to interpret that data. And uh, next up, we have a few questions that harken back to Tim's presentation. Um, and so I'll start with one from uh, Rolf Clem, who said that it seems that the various climate and crop models in the Zambia example that you shared generate highly variable predictions of yield. Have these models been applied retrospectively to assess their validity? Tim, can you chime in? Sure. Just briefly, uh, on the climate model side of things, there, there have been uh, works done, dissertations of various people uh, that, that tried to assess their uh, historic reliability. And uh, so we have, we have some of those. But in terms of the crop model side of things, because I wasn't sure whether you're referring to the climate model or the crop model, on the crop model side, at, at the uh, plot level even, there's ongoing work to assess the accuracy of the plot models in regard to the weather received. So we have both uh, measures of accuracy on, on the climate models and measures of accuracy on the crop models. And um, another somewhat specific question from uh, M. Omar Farouk. If you shift the date for planting for irrigated zones in Bangladesh, what happens uh, when, or for crops that are typically cultivated during rainy seasons? Would there be any overlapping of crops during harvest time? Well, thank you for that question. That was really a very good question. And, and at the conclusion of my, uh, my research on this, uh, because the funding and timing ran out, uh, that was my, my ongoing point, that more research would need to be done. Because once you shift one planting season, it affects every other planting season. But uh, the simple uh, idea, in, in addition to just uh, doing some more research to understand how uh, the overlap, uh, whether there would be an overlap, that is, uh, is that uh, this could point to the need for a, a more uh, shorter duration varieties of rice or other crops. Or it may point to um, somehow mixing rice with another crop that is uh, of shorter duration, although in the Bangladesh context, that, that probably wouldn't work. Excellent. Thank you. Um, another question from, uh, oh, well, first let me just mention that we have put our ending polls up on the screen. Uh, so if you wouldn't mind taking those as we continue through the, the remaining questions. Uh, these are just helpful for us to understand what you thought about the webinar, help plan uh, additional webinars in the future. Uh, so please do answer the polls that you see on your screen. Um, and it includes a, a box where if you have specific requests for information or data from the GCAN team, you can elaborate in that bottom left question uh, box, and they will get back to you. All right. So I think I'll, I'll jump to a question uh, from Daniel Kangogo. If climate smart agriculture at the farm level means introducing new technologies or breeds, what does this mean to household gender relations, workload for women, revenue for men, uh, the pieces of land that were initially used to grow women-appropriate crops? Um, he hypothesizes a situation where in the face of climate change, people will use land to grow crops that are resilient, which may lead to specialization. Um, they may be sold to buy a variety of foodstuffs, but whether that will actually happen is another issue. So just given those comments, um, within your framework, are there potential mechanisms to control this? So much well, for the I, question. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I was going to say Elizabeth will be the best. <laughs> no, no, I want you to take it. Please, please. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, on that question, I would say, you know, the ways in which uh, men and women are affected by new, you know, crop breeds or other kinds of technologies is so context specific. Um, it really depends on, you know, which crops are, you know, what roles men and women have in a particular context. If there's a certain crop that's a, a woman's crop like groundnuts in Zambia um, and a new variety is developed for that, you know, it's it, the, the, the impacts are very, very context specific. And so I think, um, 
we need, you know, for each project to really think about these kinds of gender implications of different technologies or practices that are being rolled out, given the context that they're operating in, think through what are the different gender roles in this particular context, what are men's and women's preferences and, and priorities, and, and how can we address the needs of both men and women through this project. And there are certainly risks. So if, let's say, women are cultivating a certain crop and that crop becomes much more profitable with a new uh, breed or something along those lines or a new production practice, um, you know, is there a risk that men will take over that crop? Um, what does that mean for their time in producing that crop and for their ability to uh, prepare nutritious meals at home and those sorts of things? So these are things that need to be thought through. There aren't really sort of general responses to that, but things that need to be thought through in the, within the local context. And I, I strongly believe that researchers need to work very closely with um, project implementers so that these kinds of research questions are built into the interventions and that appropriate M&E is done to identify potential harm for men and women um, as these projects are being rolled out. And um, hopefully through this project and based on this framework, we'll be able to develop some tools um, and, and, and research uh, approaches that can be used to examine these kinds of questions in the context of particular, particular interventions. Thank you. Um, uh, another, uh, another question for Elizabeth from Thalys Masambuka Kanchewa. Uh, what is the role of communities? Should, folk, there, should there be a focus on advertising versus empowerment? Uh, I feel that there has been more focus on disseminating messages to communities um, and advertising at the expense of understanding views of the community and how the views can be incorporated to influence policy kind of a broad question, but something that would be worth addressing. I think I, I also saw some other related questions about sort of extension and how messages can reach, reach men and women. Um, I think it's important, again, for each project, you know, given the local context in which they're operating in, to think about the ways in which women typically access information, what sources they depend on. Um, and then think about what kinds of approaches can be used to reach women. So if the project is relying on, you know, giving out information on climate smart practices or on, you know, the kinds of climate changes that are expected through some sort of, you know, agricultural training that only men attend, then those, the women are not going to be getting those messages. Um, if they, you know, understand that, hey, women really listen to the radio at this certain time, then maybe they can develop a broadcast to reach women um, through the radio. Or if women are involved in other kinds of groups within the community, maybe trying to insert some of those messages around climate change and climate resilient approaches um, can be brought into those group settings that maybe have to do more with nutrition training or other kinds of trainings. So um, in each case, the I think the answers are going to be very specific to the, the local context, um, but there are different approaches that are available to reach both men and women. These just have to be considered. And the other thing that has to be considered is um, what kinds of information do men and women need? So uh, some research from Senegal showed that for example, men wanted information about when the rainy seasons were starting because they plant first. Um, the women, on the other hand, wanted to know when the rains were going to end because they help their husbands plant on their plots first and then they plant on their own plots. So they have a much sort of shorter season to deal with and they want to know how, how much rainfall they're going to actually get. So thinking about what different people within the community, what kinds of information they need, and then targeting those, that information to those specific groups is also something that, that needs to be done. And I'll, I'll turn it back over to, the, to Julie. Great. Thank you very much. Um, a, uh, a question came in from Lamari Abdali, or Abdulali. Um, about social experiments, um, suggesting that more effort is needed uh, to evaluate the impacts of climate change and use of resources, including gender issues. What about using social experiments in specific communities and ecosystems? 
maybe explain um, what is meant by social experiments and how they should be used. And that was uh, targeted at Elizabeth. Question one more time. Oh, it, it's a question about um, social experiments. Um, can they be used in communities and ecosystems to, uh, to kind of gather information about the impact of climate change and, and the use of resources, uh, especially gendered social experiments? Uh, Claudia can maybe answer, um, because I guess the coordinator should speak once in a while. Um, so yes, there are a lot of these. I mean, there's lotteries, there is dictator games. So there are a lot of social experiments to see um, who really has the decision-making power. And also, those experiments are increasingly used to try to change behavior and to try to change norms um, so that for example, men uh, recognize the special needs of women and on decision making beyond domestic issues. So there are a lot that are currently ongoing, um, but often the validity remains very local, very uh, context specific. So I think what's needed is, you know, maybe wait a little bit more time, another year or so, and then to actually try to draw lessons um, of larger messages that that might be applicable to a larger context. So they are ongoing. Um, I think some very interesting insights have been derived, but the challenge remains the contextuality of these experiments. Um, uh, another question that I think you would be able to answer, uh, there was a question from Laura Ostenso about uh, heterogeneity. What exactly does that mean in the context of today's presentation? Right, very good point. I think several people have related to heterogeneity, starting with the climate change um, content presentation. So we see very heterogeneous impacts from a biophysical point of view, different climate um, patterns, and obviously uh, responses with because of different soil and water uh, availabilities. But we've also heard of heterogeneity in terms of socioeconomic conditions, ethnic groups obviously gendered heterogeneity. So heterogeneity really affects um, everything, which is, again, why it's very important to, um, to, to do these context-specific studies. So you always have to go, um, obviously, beyond regional and global and also beyond national to subnational at, at a minimum to, to better understand um, what um, adaptation and mitigation practices are most gender and uh, nutrition sensitive. And that's, it's basically a challenge, but it's also an opportunity. Um, and then, similar to the social experiments, the, the next step again has to be, you know, what could be learnings that then can be applied uh, at a larger context? Because obviously, we cannot do uh, these very localized studies everywhere. Thank you, Claudia. Uh, Jessica, there was a question that came in during, or a comment that came in during your presentation that um, would be interesting to raise, which was from uh, Claire Vanderkleij, who said that working in Zambia herself, she sees that rural communities mostly produce their own food, and crops that have nutritious benefits are usually sold, since it earns them more money rather than consuming it. Uh, they see more benefits in selling it than for their own health benefits and there is a need for awareness about the balance of economic and health benefits at the household level. Uh, do you see that, uh, you know, what level of, kind of scrutiny and importance are you, do you see of that issue, and how is it integrated into the framework? Yeah, I mean, that's a, a great point from Claire. I think there's always been um, these trade-offs between when you're producing your own food, how much of it do you sell versus how much do you keep at home for the nutrition of your family. And there's been a lot of literature looking at cash crops and is there this shifting of, of cash crops where, where people, particularly nutritious cash crops, where people will, will sell them all. And often it's, it's termed the curse of the cash crop because the income then generated 
doesn't go back into household health and nutrition. But we know there's been a lot of work by Lisa Smith and Lawrence Haddad that if you put income in the hands of a woman, you're more likely to see improvements in health and nutrition outcomes of children at the household level. So there be a benefit of engaging women in cash cropping systems. Um, we know that there is an income pathway to improving nutrition and a market-based approach to improving nutrition. So I think it's not you know, only production or only market-based. We have to think about both. So I think she brings up a, a great point. And someone else had talked about, which is very nuanced, and, and you see this in different settings depending on if you're in Ethiopia or Nepal, Sometimes there's women's crops and there's men's crops. And how do we get women more into the what's considered the cash crops um, and they don't become male-dominated? This is a big issue. Um, so Claire brings up a really good point. It's this huge trade-off. If any of you are nutritionists and you work in the field and you're talking to farmers, income always rules. So how do we ensure that the income generated is getting filtered back into the household, either indirectly or directly, to have health and nutrition benefits. And this is a, a contentious issue that people are trying to understand more and more. So she brings up a great point. Thank you for that. Thank you. And I think we have time for one more question uh, that I'll ask to Tim in just a moment. I want to uh, thank all of you for attending and remind everyone that this webinar is being recorded and you'll get a link to the recording, uh, lots of other resources and uh, in uh, a week or two. And of course, all of your comments and questions will be considered and collected. And we'll if, try and funnel as much information as we can in response to those questions and comments to you in our post-event email. Uh, so one question came in from Rolf Clem. Uh, are there tools that help predict what happens to some parts of the value chain if you influence a, a link on the chain? So if you influence one part of the value chain, what happens to all the other parts of the value chain? Are there any tools that can help uh, practitioners interpret that or, or predict what might happen? Well, that's a, that's a good question. We have a, a model at IFPRI that we've been using for more than 20 years now that keeps getting improved and refined. And what we do is we uh, take in all of the climate responses, uh, both through uh, water and through agriculture, and then we look at uh, what we think are projected productivity effects, um, income as it changes through time, population, and we do this for every country in the world, and we um, every commodity or at least uh, 60 different commodities, and we uh, look at how uh, the whole system changes over time. And so what we can see is that um, uh, changes in price of one commodity ulti ultimately influence changes in price of another commodity because uh, supply and demand interact with each other globally. And so uh, one of the concerns I think that I saw in one of the questions, or maybe even implicit in this question, is that uh, people will be, uh, not be able to afford the more nutritional foods. And, and that's always an issue, of course. But also, with the rising incomes, we find that, that um, while it is somewhat of a problem, it's not as big a problem uh, in the future as you might expect. So I hope that answered the question. Well, thank you, Tim. All right, being conscious of time, I would like to go ahead and wrap up and send a sincere thank you to our presenters for uh, sharing this information today. And an even bigger thank you to our audience. Uh, without you, uh, we wouldn't be holding these webinars. So we always uh, really appreciate your participation, your attendance, and your comments um, for how we can improve AgriLink's webinars going forward. Uh, you're always welcome to email me, Julie McCarty. My email is on the screen right now uh, with any further questions or comments. And I'll uh, make sure that those are either sent to the presenters or incorporated into how we present future webinars. On behalf of the AgriLinks team, I'd like to thank you all for attending. Uh, have a good rest of the day. And um, we'll see you at future events. Take care. <laughs>